so I'm a lawyer by trading. Uh, practiced law for a few years, did a PhD, now I'm going to start lecturing at Cambridge um, Corporate Finance and Company Law. Um, I think like a lawyer, which may help you understand perhaps how regulators may think, but I'm just saying what I think the law is, and I'd be very interested in hearing from you what the, what the legal issues are that you are facing, whether you're an entrepreneur, whether you're an investor, whether you're anything else. Um, we in our academic bubble sometimes do not necessarily know the legal issues that you're facing. Um, so I can talk about what I've seen happen in the, by regulators in the academic space, but please, by all means, interrupt me if you think that something I've been saying um, it does, just doesn't make any sense to you. If you think that we have flagged the right things for you, then please go ahead and just interrupt me at any point saying, look, this is really not what we should be looking at. This is what we should be looking at. We're looking at a few people in Cambridge, um, different departments, to see what are the legal questions that we should be fleshing out, because we had the impression we keep seeing the same talks about the same topics. Um, but if there's anything else on your mind that you think we should address, please do let me know. Uh, so that's me. But that's it's interesting. I wanted to do a few things. Sorry, yeah. Do you mind if we interject while you're speaking? No, go ahead. To, no, go ahead. Smart asset Sorry. That was down at the bottom. Um, so the question was, what is smart asset law? Do you see at the bottom? Let me just introduce it right here. Um, I've had so many questions from other lawyers saying, do you have any legal materials on smart contracts, digital assets, or blockchain? Um, and often I just had to haphazardly tell them, well, I've read something here or there, and I kept forgetting about what I've read about. So I just put this online, which is smartassetlaw.com. Um, it's very rudimentary at now. Just whatever I read I think is interesting for other lawyers in the, in the space. Um, I put it on there, and you make up your mind if you think it's interesting or not. Feel free to let me know if you see something else on law that you think um, I should put on there. Or if you have legal questions that you don't see addressed here, and you say, well, let us know, please. Um, and we were happy to talk to other academics, to law firms, to whoever it is who may give an answer to the legal questions that you're facing. So that's the other thing I'm doing in addition to teaching at Cambridge. Um, this is what I wanted to do. I don't think we'll have time um, for everything. One of the things um, we worked on with the Cambridge Center for Alternative Finance is a report which you may have seen. Uh, we compared a few jurisdictions, looked at how they dealt with crypto assets. Um, it wasn't about blockchain specifically or smart contracts, it was about crypto assets. A few of the things we found was that there were typically not enough data or not consistent data for regulators and investors to use. And so if you have to know how you regulate things, you first of all have to know well, what is it that we're regulating? How is it evolving? And that we found many regulators complained that there were not uh, independent or consistent data sources that they could draw on um, to, to help draft regulatory processes. Also, we found that there's a lot of confusing terminology. In the beginning, um, regulators talked about virtual currencies and assets, and the terminology changed. And then some regulators use this term, other regulators use that term. And then there's an overlapping uh, overlap of powers between regulators. And companies are not necessarily sure which term covers what. The regulators aren't necessarily sure. So trying to make sure that, that the, at least the terminology is clear <coughs> is really helpful to know what regulatory framework may apply to you or not. And then a third thing we found is that some companies complain that regulators often just do not fully understand technology, or not, at least not enough to understand how they should be regulating it, that they may have a basic understanding of what is a cryptocurrency, and that it's something different than a blockchain, and that a smart contract uh, may be on a blockchain or may not be. Um, but that, for example, with the Libra project now, that the legislative initiatives, the reactions that we see t tend to cover all the crypto assets and do not distinguish between something like Libra or something else. So that there's a, a, a need to understand technology. What is a, an atomic swap? What is a fork? What is a well, fork? They may know what is an airdrop. And what should we do with that? That many of these issues that regulators haven't really thought about, thought, thought about yet. Um, these are some of the findings of the report with the Cambridge Center for Alternative Finance. Um, just saying that the first statements from regulators were mostly done by central banks. Uh, mostly in 2013, but that's not that interesting. This is how the terminology changed. First, we, they used mostly the term virtual currencies in laws and regulatory guidance. Now we're more looking at finance, uh, digital assets or crypto assets even. This is a smart asset law if you're interested. Um, you probably already heard from the other presentations that the, however you use it, whatever you use an asset, how, whatever technology you use for an asset doesn't change the laws that apply. So typically most laws are technology neutral. The substance trumps the form. So no matter whether you call whether it's a tokenized security or a security, the same laws typically apply. Um, but the, there, there's still some uncertainty about, okay, you have the existing laws and they may apply, but which of the existing laws apply? And some of the details of how to apply these laws may not be clear for every single detail of this technology. And then the third question is that, of course, even if you know that certain laws apply, how do you enforce it, which may not always be clear. Um, I want to talk about the legal issues of these things different, uh, separately. There's some of overlaps, of course. Some of the legal issues affecting one may affect the other, but not necessarily. Um, 
for digital assets, just to know anybody who is sick of hearing about securities and token classifications? They, they just have my, my speech. On oh, they just said your speech, OK. They're very proficient now. Oh, per perfect, perfect, because there's so much written about this that perhaps that's not, definitely not the only thing that's affecting us. The one thing that may point out is for these hybrid tokens, where it's, for example, a security token and a payment token, that some regulators say, well, in that case, you, you, the regulatory requirements are um, cumulative. You should comply with all the banking laws, payment laws, and all the securities laws. In other jurisdictions, of regulators saying, it's like Switzer that, well, Switzerland officially says it's cumulative. If you have tokens that fall in more than ca one category, the laws of each of that category apply to that token. But in in practice, actually, it seems like it's more hierarchical. As soon as a token has mainly security issues, the securities laws will apply and the rest probably will not. Even though some regulators say, no, we look at the dominant feature um, at the time of whenever a legal issue arises. What was the dominant feature at that time? And then we'll apply that legal framework. But for hybrids, there's still some, some, some uncertainty. Uh, what does that mean to be a hybrid? Doesn't mean you have to comply with all the laws, with certain laws. Is it hierarchical or, or not? And that can change over time, of course, per project. These are all of the these are some of the issues that we face. I think most of the time we talk about securities laws, banking laws, payment laws, perhaps GDPR. There are a few other types of legal issues um, that perhaps you haven't heard of. Uh, I'm trying to go through those now. Securities laws, by now I understand you've, you know all of this, so I don't have to go into this. Um, the SEC basically wants everything. Most of the things, most of these token sales are a, are issuances are covered by securities laws. Um, but when you actually look at enforcement, it, often you hear the SEC is very strict, US is very strict, but when you look at enforcement, it's been mostly limited to the very outer limits um, of the practice. So as long as you stay in a relatively safe middle zone, it seems that you haven't been targeted by enforcement yet. So the laws themselves or the guidance may be very strict and may be very broad. But looking at enforcement, actually enforcement actions have been limited to outright scams or frauds or some of the very, very gray areas. Um, so it seems like there were still some room to maneuver, um, especially outside the US, but even in the US, to experiment and uh, not necessarily be um, targeted with, with legal lawsuits, except, of course, if you, if you have the WannaCry um, attack and then the ransomware is being launched through your exchange to go to North Korea and these things, then perhaps you get into trouble. But typically, actually, I'm quite surprised to see that they haven't gone further and that they're allowing to wait back and see and let the space develop. Um, not everybody may agree with that, but from a lawyer's perspective, they could have gone much further. Um, banking laws. Um, Sorry, I, I just had one question. I don't quite understand how it's working in the, the States, and I'm Canadian, so that's why, even though I have the accent, I still don't understand. Um, in Wyoming, for example, they're very crypto friendly, and then there's certain states that are crypto friendly, mm. but then the SEC gets involved. And how can that be happening? I just don't get it. So, yep. For any federal system like the US, you have certain competence, what they call certain topics that only US federal legislators or regulators can deal with. Um, securities laws is one of them. So only the, normally only the federal uh, Congress okay, or only the SEC can deal with that. Wyoming or Ohio or a few of these other states that have been very crypto friendly, um, they can only do so because the federal state or federal laws have given them some power or left some power under the constitution to, for states to deal with them. It could be saying, for example, Ohio, you can pay your taxes in Bitcoin. It has nothing to do with the SEC um, or some other, some other issues that they leave to the state level. But so, so there's a complementarity of competences, certain things that are kept to the federal level, so SEC, CFTC, uh, FinCEN, and these other regulators and laws. And then the state level are other complementary powers that are not... Um, mutually exclusive. Yeah. yeah, a bit like the EU at a certain point, <laughs> to some extent. Um, banking and payments, you know that the anti-money laundering directive applies, sorry, the, the fifth um, money laundering directive now from the EU applies only for crypto to fiat exchanges and not to um, non-custodial wallet providers. That may change because the implementation for every member state, in, so every member state has some room for maneuver to have some liberty to say, well, the directive is a minimum standard and we go beyond it or not. And many member states have considered um, making the money laundering um, obligations also for crypto to crypto exchanges and for non-custodial wallet providers. And they're doing that mainly because they think uh, there shouldn't be an exception for any other type of wallet or any type of exchange. And also because the Financial Action Task Force um, has set the, le the level quite high saying, well, it shouldn't be limited, these money laundering provisions, anti-terrorism provisions, shouldn't be limited 
to centralized exchanges, uh, so crypto to fiat, um, which should also co cover crypto to crypto and should also cover non-custodial wallets. So you see them in discussions like in this country, another country saying, well, if we're going to implement this fifth money laundering directive, then we can as well implement it and say it also covers crypto to crypto and non-custodial wallets. Um, so you, you may see there now there's some hesitation, but if one starts doing it, then you may see some other um, countries following suit. You had a question. Yeah, so I'm wondering how is this uh, enforceable, having some kind of KYC on non-custodial wallets? At the, at the mm. basics, right, it's it's a number, right? A wallet is can be in my brain. I can do math and sign transactions that modify this, this ledger. So... I don't see how is this enforceable. So the question is, how can you enforce these rules against um, yeah non-custodial non wallets. wallets? And you know, most of them are open source, so you can just yeah. you know create thousands and thousands of them. Uh, so it's a very good question. You can say the laws apply, but then the next question is, can you actually enforce them? Uh, yeah. Okay. And typically, regulators are very good at trying to find a, a hook somewhere, somehow, to someone. Um, though if it's wallet to wallet and nobody has a view on it, yes, it's very hard to, to, to see it, uh, even for the regulators just to identify the transaction, let alone to be able to enforce it. Um, it depends really on which application you're using, which service you're using, but if there's any type of person or face or logo behind it, that may be that hook. For example, many of the, many of the, the companies I've seen, but you may know this much better, still have, um, they have their team profiles online, the CTO, the CFO, yeah. that's a hook. You have a privacy policy saying email this address when, uh, when you have a privacy policy question or some other question, that's a hook. Uh, so there are many different ways of, of, of regulating. Say, well, you may say you're fully decentralized, but somewhere, somehow there's a face, there's a person. And whether that face is an entity, a, a corporation, or whether that face is actually seen as just an informal group that may be a partnership, which means everybody is held liable potentially for any breach of law, regulators are very likely to find that hook somewhere to some face or some person or some position or some foundation. Um, and in that case, they, they may do it. My question is, will they do it? So far, they haven't done it, even though in certain cases, I think they could have done it. So my question is, even though they may be able to find somebody, somebody who may be held liable, perhaps they've been holding off because they know if you start attacking one developer, one CTO, or one miner, then you don't know where it's going to stop, and you may not be the first one who makes that potentially mistake. Um, so whether they're willing to do that is a different question, and whether they even can, depending on this. Just accelerate the arm race, too. If they you know, if they start enforcing it, people will... So the question is whether this will reinforce an arms race. Well, if one regulator starts enforcing it, will the others follow suit? Um, I have the impression they're all just waiting to see. As soon as one person, one state may take the initiative, they will see what's the backlash, are there unintended consequences, and they will learn. For now, nobody's doing it because I think they still don't know how to do it. There has been a lot of talk about it, um, whether it's legally possible, but at the regulator's level, I have the impression the discussion of whether to actually do it is one thing, but then how to enforce it. I'm not sure that they know enough about the scene, about the companies, about technology, about it, how it actually works in a truly decentralized version to understand what that may mean. So that the, the reason why they're not doing it may be policy, just wait and see. And the other reason maybe we just don't know yet. And we're going to see how things develop if there's a maker that we can hook onto or if there's another, um, another company or foundation or group that we can hook onto, then we'll see and test the limits of the law once there's a little bit more certainty what the bigger players are. There was a second question, sorry, also a question there. So <clears throat> just to simplify, it seems that if there is a front end somehow, then I have to have a money laundry or KYC or whatever. So standing to what has been described here, so it seems like the only way would be I can deploy a smart contracts. The smart contracts is fully decentralized. Everything else that is basically the UI to use it, uh, which is a website uh, or a mobile app, uh, that would be a possible hook. Uh, and then basically the, the regulator could enforce these things. Shall I repeat the question? So the question, no, the question was called on, on, on the microphone. Um, so first of all, the question is who's actually involved with the funds, because for money laundering rules to apply, you have to have some transfer of money somehow. If you just have the front end, but you're not at all involved in the money chain, it would be hard to see how you can have money laundering applications applying to you, because you're not actually in the business of financial transfers. Okay. But if I think this is a very important uh, yeah. point because uh, if I'm providing uh, an, a non-custodial wallet and I'm providing only, let's say, the software and then I'm not, so I'm not obliged to, 
implement those regulations. If that stand, I think we can have a non-custodial wallet. If so I get right what you said. So that's the first question. Is there anything you're doing that could be called by money laundering? I think so only, if only if we, so if I'm providing a wallet, I potentially can receive money and I will send money. So at that point, I think uh, potentially yeah. uh, I could, yeah. but so I'm just a provider. So I'm just providing a UI that allow you to send and receive money. I'm not receiving money. So that's my point. Like, can we say that this is software or I'm a service provider? Because if I'm a service provider, probably I need all those rules. But if I'm a software, not. But I'm an engineer, so I'm not a lawyer, so. <laughs> it's a very good question. I'm not sure how far they will push the boundaries of saying you're a service provider. Because if the way that the transfer is made possible is through you, but you're not holding the coins, it hasn't been tested yet, as far as I know, whether that will be under a service provider. The only thing I've known is that the more and more we're looking for a way to find the hook into the person responsible for the funds. And if you're facilitating somehow the transfer funds, even if it's only through providing the software, the user interface, um, there may be a gray zone where you still fall under that regulation, under those laws, because okay. you're facilitating an activity yeah. that otherwise Thank wouldn't be Thank you for the answer. <laughs> Actually, it's a paper by itself, and there are many of these questions that we still have to look into in depth and see what in depth and what, what is the, what, what case law do we have to, to look at this. Um, one thing on that point, I think you wouldn't be held liable under product liability in this country, for example, because software is not a product. So in this country, at least, when, you're, when you make an, a user interface, that product, if there would be any problem um, in the defect in the code, you wouldn't be held liable because software isn't a product. But that's separate from a question about money laundering, separate from a question about GDPR, separate from a question about many different aspects of law. Um, <laughs> yeah. Each other questions. If you <laughs> are you all sick of this already? No. no. If you don't want to know, but the only no, thing no, I, no. <laughs> the only reason why I mentioned these things, like is it property, is it property or not to have a token? It may seem very academic, but in the end, it matters. If you have a, a divorce proceeding and some of a token holder, if somebody dies and they hold their tokens, or got, somebody goes bankrupt and they have their tokens, is that part of the the, the, the proceedings of whatever? assets um, that are in, in, in the pool or not, because if they're not, then you can just get rid of them without taking into account the bankruptcy proceedings, the force proceedings. If they are, they will be in the pool and segregated as bankruptcy assets, for example. Um, legal qualification matters al also to know if a token is uh, money. For example, in this country, um, there's been some arguments saying, well, if you pay something with crypto rather than actual fiat currency, it's not actually a sale of goods or a sale, it's just barter. It's the same as giving one berry and getting another berry in return. I think that's very far-fetched. I don't think um, that's necessarily good or legal analysis that will make it. Um, but these so labeling a token as money or not really matters for these kind of legal questions that we may not think about it in the first instance. The same if you buy something for crypto and you get a good in return or something else in return. If the crypto tokens that you bought it with or that you get back in return somehow are tainted, they come from there's been a hack and you somehow get these tainted tokens. Um, there is a there's some some law in this country, but also elsewhere that says if you go to a market, secondhand market, whatever, and you buy an apple and you pay with cash, you get cash back. As long as you bought it in good faith and you have your the, your the dollars or the pounds you got in return and you have your apple and you bought it in good faith. Whether the app was stolen is none of your business. It's not your problem. Whether the cash you were given back is stolen is not your problem. But if crypto is not seen as money, that may become your problem. So if the crypto is stolen and it's not considered money, you wouldn't necessarily be covered by this good faith purchaser exemption. So these are legal questions that perhaps may seem very academic, but it matters if you start transferring assets uh, and there may be some problems with hacking, etc. that you may need to know, can you rely on these exceptions or not? Um, international law, public international law is a law between states. That's not very relevant, I think, for most of you in decentralized finance, except when um, coins are used for money laundering against, uh, sorry, not money laundering, but go against international sanctions regime, against Iran, against uh, Venezuela, um, against North Korea, for example, then it matters. There is also some basic right to property, which, may, which is typically very broadly um, interpreted by 
entities such as the European Court of Human Rights. So if ever your tokens are taken uh, and you're in the UK, the judge will say, no, it's not property. You have no right to free course. It may be that the European Court of Human Rights or other international treaties say, no, that was your property because we have a very broad definition of it and you were expropriated. So therefore you have legal recourse. Private international law, um, I haven't seen much about that in, in academic literature, but I think it's quite important because what do you do when you have a smart contract transferring assets between borders? So as soon as you have private transactions across borders, which law applies, which court applies? So for example, to know is it property, what kind of money laundering issues do we have to take into consideration? It's very important to know which law and which court, perhaps more, more which law than which court. Um, in the EU, we have two regulations, one which says, okay, in this is a law that applies, the other one, this is a court that may apply. For contractual obligations, which will be the case for most smart contracts, you can typically have a choice of law provision. So either you have a contract written out saying, we choose a law of the UK, we choose a law of Estonia, and we go to a court in the Netherlands or Denmark. You can normally choose that when it's a contractual obligation. You can hopefully perhaps someday also put it in your smart contract coding, saying automatically anybody using our smart contract agrees that the law that applies in case of any dispute is this one or even go for arbitration, whatever you prefer. If there's no choice of law, so if you don't think about which law you want to apply, there are these rules and the regulations that will figure it out for you. And that may not be the law that you want to apply to your customers or to your operations. Uh, typically, it's a characteristic service for contracts. So what is a characteristic service for a maker or for a guesser? Um, some, are, some academics have said, well, the characteristic service in any blockchain application is the miners, because without the miners, the system would fall apart. I don't think that's a more sophisticated understanding of what the characteristic um, service is for contracts uh, for blockchain applications. And I think that confuses the protocol versus application layer versus individual transaction layer. So the literature there on that question is very limited, but just think, th think it through if you have smart contract applications. If you want to think about which law applies, make sure you have the consent of your users in one way or another, or you make it clear to your users in uh, one way or another. You cannot um, choose a law applicable to tort if you, if you damage somebody who has nothing to do with you, a third party, a non-contractual party, um, then there are different rules, but you cannot contract out of that typically, so you shouldn't even have to think about that too much in your smart contract application. Data protection, everybody's heard of GDPR. Do you want me to, yeah, we can skip that? Good. Competition law, perhaps something that, um, I have seen people mention competition law, but depending on what kind of data you make visible to your users, there may be some competition law concerns. The most um, risky, legal risk one, legal, legally risky one is cartel allegations. So if there's any data, metadata or other data visible to companies, startups, whoever it is, investors who are competitors, that may um, violate uh, cartel um, rules in the EU. And the EU is pretty strict in it. You can have a fine up to 10% of your global turnover. Um, so if there is any data visible to competitors that could help e could help them see the strategies of other competitors and perhaps set prices or see who's active in what region of the world and then somehow coordinate who's going to be active. Yeah, sorry, you have a question on this? Just if you could oh, sorry. If you could um, discuss shortly the um, implications of GDPR for blockchain applications. Let's say I have an application that allows a user to save a bit of data on, on this um, public blockchain and I'm, I know that GDPR there's some kind of right to forget right to be, forgot sec, right to be forgotten yeah. so how does that apply in this context is if, if data cannot be changed on the blockchain or someone loses their key I lose their key or users loses their key like how is that treated if you would know it you would have a very good very good presentation so there you know that's a big question when okay. how can, GDPR was issued at a published at a time or put into force at a time we already had blockchain, but they just didn't put it in there how it should apply, so nobody knew. And so then, is there any wording about blockchain in the GDPR no, text? No. no, and it's also the principle of technological neutrality. Whatever technology okay. you use should not matter. The GDPR still applies, but it's up to you to decide how to do it. The regulators didn't tell you. The okay. GDPR doesn't tell you how to do it. And so the EU forum, blockchain forum and observatory, you, which you may have heard of, mm -hmm. Um, they have a report on GDPR and blockchain. There's some other commentators who have talked about that. The GDPR only applies to personal data, so data that in some way um, can be identified, can be traced back to a single person. Um, what I would say, oh, yeah, it has to be irreversibly anonymized. Um, so in this case, if you have the right to be forgotten, and you say I want my data to be forgotten, 
the only way to do it. So the, the E report gives some suggestions. What about if you salt, pe salting, um, salting, peppering, some other keeping data off chain? But even if you keep it off chain, what they're saying, the only way for you to have data anonymized irreversibly is if there's only one private key to that data and you can prove that you destroyed that private key. Go figure how to do that. So if there's more than one private key. That sounds like a math PhD in itself. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I think <laughs> we've been thinking about it as lawyers. Yeah. It needs to be irreversibly anonymized. Um, we don't know how to do that, except when you make it so complicated, every single piece of information that could be identifiable or linked to a person is secured separately by one, one private key that then can provably be destroyed, not just lost or destroyed, but you can prove that you actually destroyed it. Um, but my feeling is that things will come up. And so far, there hasn't been any, as far as I'm aware, there hasn't been any case law. There hasn't been any lawsuits about this. Um, so it may be the same as with the crypto in the beginning that, yes, there's a lot of talk about it. This should happen. That should happen. But when you look at the actual enforcement, that when it's blatantly, you know, blatantly disregarding the law, you may get in trouble. But as long as you're trying or as long as it's not very clear, as long as you're following the, the normal practice in the area, it may be that regulators will just say, well, we don't know. Let's see how it evolves. But to answer your question, so the GDPR doesn't talk about it. Um, the EU forum has issued that report. The question was, how would you do this? It's still not clear. They didn't give a single answer. They couldn't give a single answer. And as far as I'm aware, no regulator. There's some hints at what you could do, but whether these hints are um, can be transformed into practical solutions that are not too complex, not too costly, will not slow down the system too much. I haven't seen that solution yet. But perhaps you know that much better. Uh, being a non-lawyer and having an idea about technology, you may know that. If you find a way out, you know, <laughs> very, very happy to, uh, to hear. And my other, my other concern about that is stored encrypted. But even then, as long as you encrypt it, can the yeah. encryption be undone? If it's a hash, it's different. Uh, if it's a, if it's a public-private key encryption, there's still a way, in theory, to reverse it. As long as you can reverse it, because there is a private key that could be retrieved somehow, or public key, then uh, the GDPR will say you're in, t you're, you you're in trouble. I think what happens typically in law is you have all these standards, like competition law, the same thing. But as long as you can show we did our best, or we have policies in place, or we did our due diligence, or we followed the normal market practices, that would typically mitigate it. It could be that either that prevents, that prevents regulators from enforcing it, because they know there are other people to look at first who didn't even try, didn't even make an effort. But even, and when you try, I think you, typically there's a mitigating circumstance to say, look, we tried. We did whatever we could with the technology we had. It was just developing. And it may be that, like with the DAO, in the end, there is an investigative report, but no actual liability is being imposed on anybody, because we just didn't know. Um, yeah, with quantum computing, I have a, a question about that because everything that's now encrypted with ECC, ECDSA, in a few years will be, will be able to see that probably. And that means that all the data now are not fully compliant GDPR once there's a quantum computer. Because you could now store all the data and then just in a few years see, oh, well, actually, what did they do back in 2019? And for some, for some data, that may not matter. But for other data that are, that are personal, like gender-based, health-based, whatever it is, that may still be a problem in the future if you don't think about it now. Uh, competition law for anybody having a market share of more than 50%, there are special rules that apply. It's much more strict who you can, like your pricing policies, who you can exclude from your network or not. And 50% market share may seem like a lot, but um, actually it depends on how you define a market and it can be a very, very niche market. It may not be a problem. Um, liability of miners. Everybody probably knows the, the paper by Angela Wells saying we should have fiduciary duties of um, developers at least. Um, there are very few laws that actually deal with that problem. What should developers be afraid of? Are there any legal risks for them? Ex some exceptions, like in Bermuda, where they're, like, where they're explicitly excluded from certain laws. Um, product liability, as I said, that's not a concern, at least not in this country. GDPR liabilities, the EU forum, that report that I mentioned um, on GDPR says, well, at least for decentralized organizations, we shouldn't impose any liability on developers, really. And I think that's going to be the general line of arguments. I cannot predict it with any certainty, but my, my, my thinking is that if you start imposing liability for miners or for developers in fully decentralized systems, it may mean that you have to look at how technology works in practice and you may not have fully understood how it works in practice. So it, again, it may be that very technically, le limit, legally technically, you could say some, some of these developers, miners, or whoever is a CFO on your website or CTO on a website, 
um, may be a processor or controller on this under the GDPR. I haven't seen any case law again, uh, about this, and I would be. I think it's going a bit too far. And uh, but these statements have been made potentially before we really knew how it would all work out and what decentralization actually means. So I'm, I'm not too worried about it at this point, but I can imagine if you're a developer, you just want to be sure. One thing to know if, if you're working with people together, you say, oh, we're not a company, we're just a foundation, you may still be called by partnerships um, laws, which mean you have, in principle, individual liability, um, full liability, perhaps shared liability with everybody in the partnership, if you would be considered as a group to be a partnership. Um, but again, I haven't seen that happen in practice, and in, it depends on where the governance rights, who makes the strategic decisions, um, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So there are so many things to take into account uh, from a legal background that it really depends from project to project how you apply that. Um, again, I think it's unlikely that there will be a concern soon. Smart contracts, there's no we're running out of time. I don't want to take your coffee break. So interpretation, some issues there. Um, some commentators have said, well, if there's a problem with your smart contracts and it didn't really work the way you wanted it to work, you should probably look at the last stage where there was human-to-human -human interaction. That could be in your community, you had been talking about what do we want to achieve, and if a smart contract doesn't achieve it, it could be that you go back to that last human-to-human -human level and say, this is what we actually intended to achieve. Even though the smart contract didn't do it, we can now claim that the smart contract was effective and uh, that therefore we should go back to what we intended. If you look at GitHub or you can look, look at whatever community forum that we had where we discussed what we wanted to achieve. Um, the, for smart contracts, the idea is it really a contract. Can you even enforce it if anything goes wrong? There are different ways of enforcing things, maybe through just peer pressure, maybe through your own informal arbitration, maybe through many means other than typical courts. Um, but there's some questions about how you make sure that people contracting have a legal capacity to contract, how, um, how there's a, a meeting of minds, how can you prove that, is a signature even valid if it's just a smart contract application. But most of these questions are not um, like, is, is, it, is a digital signature valid? In some countries it's still a problem, in most countries it's not, or it will no longer be for a long time. So these questions I think are relatively easy to, um, to solve. Um, then another question is about automated entities. Can you have fully automated entities without even having corporations with directors? Can you just have automated entities making their own decisions, strategic decisions, management decisions? And is that even legal to have these, um, these, these automated entities? In some countries it likely is, other countries not. But um, one example is if you have internet, if in, internet of Things devices and they have to communicate with each other, can you completely exclude um, companies, legal persons, and just have automated um, entities? In some countries, that's already possible. Even though it's very new, we haven't written about it much, but it seems like technically it is possible. Um, I don't think we'll have time for this. I wanted to look at different approaches that different, um, different regulators have taken. Um, this is a distinction that we made in the Center for Alternative Finance report. Um, the strange thing that we found is that the more, the more active the community was in crypto and de uh, decentralized finance, not per se as such, but in crypto and blockchain, the more active they were in a certain country, the more likely it was that governments relied just on the existing laws and perhaps tried to fit whatever was happening already in their jurisdiction under the existing laws. While the countries that came up with a specific framework, a bespoke framework just for fintech, just for blockchains, were typically the countries that didn't have much um, didn't have much activity yet and were just trying to accept it, uh, attract it. So the ones that had a lot of activity, they didn't have the time to do anything else. They didn't have time to come up with new laws. They just applied the existing laws. While the ones that, um, <coughs> that didn't have much activity, they tried to come up with uh, their specific framework, very bespoke framework to come up uh, to attract funding. Um, and I think this is going to eat so much into your cover break. And I think we'll just, we'll just leave it there. If you have any questions. Which is the best one? <laughs> what do you want? What do you want? It depends. Some people have told me, oh, we look at the regulatory framework, certainty that we know the laws are on the books and we know the definition of what is an asset. Other people have said, no, it's really the regulators. If you have close contact with them, we can actually talk to them often. Um, if they're open to talk to us, other people say, well, the best is not legal. The best is where you can attract your investors, where you can attract your talent. So the legal considerations aren't that important. We just see where we can get the talent together and the money together to do a project. And then where we incorporate doesn't matter that much. Um, I've heard some good things about Malaysia, for example, and I have heard some bad, bad things about FCA, even though um, they've taken a very much a FCA, which country is that? this country. Oh, okay. Okay. Say, well, Just one question on the FCA. If, yeah, if anybody wants to. Yeah. Sorry. On the FCA, you know, everybody says that they're part of the sandbox at the FCA, yeah, and we're yeah. in the sandbox. That's really wonderful. But at the end of the day, you see so many 
horrible, terrible projects that are in the sandbox. And you talk to people at the FCA and they say, yeah, I know, it doesn't really matter. So what's your take on the sandbox? I've heard a lot of criticism saying either you don't regulate it and you leave it in the dark and at least people know there's no regulation or safety in it. Other people say, well, if you leave it in the dark, then even the people trying to, you know, if you leave it in the dark and there's no sandbox, the regulators cannot learn. So it's more an espionage vehicle for the regulators. Yes, to see. But then people get sometimes misled saying, well, at least we saw it on the FCA website. Yeah. So we thought somehow there would be security a safety net, but there isn't. So I'm not sure what the best thing is. I'm happy sometimes to see that there are some options other than just being in the dark. But I can see why people say, well, you shouldn't give a stamp almost or seem to give a stamp of approval to companies that are not regulated at all. It's just they're in closer contact with the regulators and closer under the eye of the regulators, but they're not regulated necessarily. If there's time, if anybody wants to leave for coffee, please do so. We would be very grateful if you could share your views on uh, privacy coins and how you think they might be regulated. So the question here is um, privacy coins and how they may be regulated. From a lawyer's perspective, what I've seen with regulators, I think it's very unlikely that they will give their approval to anything where they do not know the identity of the people that are transacting. If you look at the whole infrastructure that has been set up for KYC, AML, corruption, um, it seems to me so unlikely that they'd be willing to avoid to, uh, to allow any type of privacy coin. But then you've seen the, the JP Morgan is partnering up with uh, Zcash. So they're using a privacy coin, but then put it in this typical financial institution where they do the due diligence, they knew the KYC before they allow you into the system. But once you're in the system, you cannot see from each other which transactions are happening so that all the competitors in JP Morgan's pool cannot see from each other what they're doing. Otherwise, you have a competition law violation. Um, so as long as you combine a privacy with prior, prior, prior KYC checks, identity checks, then it, there will not be a problem, I think. But as soon as you keep it completely private and there's full anonymity, I don't see how regulators will be willing to allow that under current laws. I don't see how they could fit, in, fit that in and just say, well, in that case, we just drop AML laws. We, do, we just don't do it. I don't think they will be willing to do that. <clears throat> You said before that one of the characteristics of the money is that is uh, uh, the cash, sorry, is anonymous. So we, in the current system, we have a moment where I'm completely anonymous. So mm -hmm. I don't understand why the regulator shouldn't accept the fact that the portion of the system is anonymous as the current one. So I think there is a strong case to yes. have a private transaction. And I think that in the end, uh, we will learn to have something like that. Because even in the previous slides, you were saying like, we shouldn't allow to know what's happening between my companies and, and other companies. Yeah. And if there is no private transaction, how we can achieve that? So if there are kind of private transaction, we're going to also have uh, privacy in the uh, money transactions as well. So it seems to me like they're a bit blind <laughs> in the reality. So the reality is we need privacy because currently we have HTTPS, we have all those things. And they are at the base of even democracy. I don't want it to, to, to be, but in mm. the end, is that the, the, the problem we are facing? Yes, you're not the only one who has said, well, cash is already anonymous. Why can we not have anonymous crypto? And the argument regulators simply make is, well, cash is not fully anonymous because normally there's a, a number on the banknotes or somebody, a central institution issues it. And there are entry points and exit points where the cash is being you know, checked. Is it real or not? Is being counted? Is being Go, it's go, gone through the system. Same. You could do the same. But and then, then the, there is a kind of anonymous. I can buy bread and I don't need to be tracked down in every booth right to do it. But know, let's be life. honest, the people they're worried about aren't the people buying bread. <laughs> yeah, just to interject on that, the difference is also there's Fair. limits on cash as well, right? Yes, like, yeah, there's monetary policy. There's uh, a monetary so policy like reason, but that's... Portion, so we need something that mm -hmm. is a shielding us from having everything open. But so I, I think right now, um, for cryptocurrencies at least, you can, uh, you know, transfer a very large amount of privacy coins way above the, the okay. cash limit of, yeah, yeah, of yeah, a yeah, payment yeah, that you can usually do. So I think it's uh, That's the knowledge of doing today this, it doesn't mean that the regulator is in the same direction. Yes, it's true. We have the knowledge of something doesn't mean that the regulators follow us. Maybe that the regulator follows eventually, seeing that certain types of privacy coins or anonymization are not that bad, or as, as you say, are similar to cash, and may not impact monetary policy as much as they uh, presume, but we're still very, very far away from that. I see your argument. I've seen the arguments uh, made several times, and I've seen the regulators, academics knock it down. Whether that's who holds the best argument, 
I don't know. I see. I see what you're saying. I, I also. I like my cash for my privacy. <laughs> Let's end it there, and you can guys continue. Yeah. Ask me any questions a few later on. Thank you. Thank you.